intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. So let's talk about the difference between those two words and then uh, some of the properties that arise um, due to these intermolecular forces, which of course are, are come about because of the intramolecular forces. So to clarify, intra meaning within. And so if you have a molecule, it's going to be held together by shared pairs of electrons. Um, so that would be the intramolecular forces. And you can look at the partial charges and the, the polarity of the bonds and the dipoles. Um, that's all intra. That's within the molecule. If you're drawing a molecule, you show all that information. Then we have our intermolecular forces. And so you can't show an intermolecular force because with a single molecule because this is between different particles and just to get this in here this is with in so intra is within inter is between and so if you want to show an intermolecular force you've got to draw at least two molecules and then you can say okay well how are they going to interact with each other and so if you're talking about a pure substance you've got two of the same molecules and you can talk about the interactions between them um, and again that intermolecular force will depend on what the molecule is like, which is what the intramolecular force shows you. So once you get the intramolecular forces figured out, you can say, okay, well, what then will be the intermolecular forces? And then what are the results of those? So again, figure out the intramolecular forces, what are the particles like? And then you can figure out what they're doing, the intermolecular forces and all of the properties that arise do that. So again, intramolecular forces, um, we can calculate the electronegativity difference, and that's, that's sort of the main thing that we're doing here to figure out, okay, well, these two atoms, when they um, stabilize, they, they, what's going to happen with their electrons here? Um, they could form ionic bonds, and you, you have ions. Um, you could have sharing of electrons, so you have covalent bonds, molecules. And there's also metallic bonds when you have just metals coming together. They don't transfer their electrons, right? Because if they're the same atom, their delta N would have to be zero. But they also don't act like molecules. They form this crystal. It's like a, a, a giant crystal where they all share their electrons within there. And that's called a metallic bond. All three of those are intramolecular. So we have this force within the compound itself um, that sort of determines what type of compound you have. Once we know we're dealing with molecules, then we can do some interesting work on the intermolecular forces. So if you took one of those molecules and another one of those molecules and you put them together, how are they going to act? And if we stick to pure substances, it's a little bit easier. Um, definitely they're going to have what's called London dispersion forces or sometimes just dispersion forces or sometimes just London forces. Um, all of that's referring to the same thing. So anytime you have a molecule, it's going to be attracted to other molecules regardless um, the molecules are made of atoms the atoms have protons and electrons and so if you get them near each other the protons of one will be attracted to the electrons of the other and that is called london dispersion forces so that's always going to be the case the more atoms you have um, or actually the more protons and electrons you have so if you have bigger atoms it's even more so the more protons and electrons you have within a molecule the more attracted it will be to other molecules then we have these dipole-dipole forces. So this is all that work we did on polarity. So if you do a, a structural diagram of a molecule, you figure out how the electrons are being shared, who's hogging whose electrons, the delta En, the electronegativity difference, the dipoles, all that. And you figure out whether you have a polar molecule or not. If you have a polar molecule, those dipoles in one molecule will be attracted to the dipoles in another molecule. Kind of like two magnets get attracted to each other, but it's not magnetic attraction, it's electrostatic. Um, and so polar molecules are going to be attracted to the oppositely charged pole on another molecule. And again, that's quite a strong force as well as we saw with water. It can be so strong that it actually gets its own label. So a particular type of dipole-dipole force that is so strong it actually gets its own subsection are hydrogen bonds. And this is when you're dealing with hydrogen bonding to something super electronegative like oxygen, fluorine, or that should actually say nitrogen, not fluorine, um, for, for sure fluorine, but uh, also nitrogen. So hydrogen bonded oxygen, hydrogen bonded to fluorine, 
and hydrogen bonded to nitrogen will all create dipoles, of course, because you have unequal sharing, but really strong dipoles, so strong that they form this thing called hydrogen bonding as an intermolecular force. So remember, you can't have this unless you have more than one molecule. So you'd never show an intermolecular force with only one molecule, because that doesn't make sense. That would be an intramolecular force as you're talking about. If you want to do an intermolecular force, like a hydrogen bond, you've got to have two different molecules to show that. So nonpolar molecules, the only thing holding them together or detracting them towards uh, each other, I should say, a group of them together, um, are these London forces or, or dispersion forces or London dispersion forces. So they are fairly weakly attracted. They are attracted because they do have protons and electrons, and so they are attracted to each other's protons and electrons, but it is relatively weak. It doesn't take much energy to get them moving to the point where they can fly apart from each other, turn into a gas. Polar molecules, though, have these dipoles, which give them a partial positive, partial negative end, and so they are more strongly attracted to each other. And so if you had a comparable size molecule that had a dipole versus one that didn't, the ones that have the dipole are going to be more attracted to each other. Um, they're going to be held more tightly together. And so you can see that a nonpolar molecule of a given size versus a polar molecule of a given size, they're going to be held differently. And so we end up with these nonpolar molecules being very easy to turn into a gas, whereas these polar molecules might be more difficult to turn into a gas. You had to give them more energy to do so. And remember, this is, we're looking at two variables here. The polarity of them is one variable, but also the size is also going to factor in here. So you've got two variables. If you have a really big nonpolar molecule, it will stick together well because it's so big. Um, and again, if you have a small polar molecule, it won't stick together as well. So it's both the polarity as well as the size that will interact together to tell you um, what sort of properties it's going to have. So let's look at water as an example of a particularly polar molecule. Um, it is quite small, but it also has strong polarity to it. It has the ability to form these hydrogen bonds because you have hydrogen and oxygen attached to each other. And remember, that is not the hydrogen bond, right? So if you look at a molecule of water, the bond between the oxygen and hydrogen is not the hydrogen bond. That's the common misconception, right? Because the oxygen and hydrogen are attached to each other, that gives them the ability to create a hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bond is actually the fact that this hydrogen has such a partial positive charge because it's bonded to this oxygen, that that partial positive charge is going to be really attractive and it could be attracted to a partially negatively charged oxygen the attraction between those two different molecules, which again is a intermolecular force, that's the hydrogen bond. And you only get that when you have molecules that have hydrogens bonded to oxygens or fluorines or nitrogens. So if you had hydrogen bonded to fluorine, let's say, a really simple Lewis diagram here, um, you're gonna have a really negative fluorine and a really, I should say partially negative fluorine, a really partially positive hydrogen. So again, there's no hydrogen bond there. You can't show a hydrogen bond with a single molecule. But what you could do is you could say, okay, well, if I had a group of these guys, there's another one here. Um, again, it's going to have a really partially negative fluorine, a really partially positive hydrogen. And then the force between those, and so you have to draw it differently. You can't draw it as a line because we already used that to show a covalent bond. But there's going to be an attractive force between the two different molecules, which again is intermolecular. Um, and again, if it's, it's if this is an intermolecular dipole force, let's put the dipoles in here as well. So we have this positive dipole, uh, ended, positive end of the dipole at the hydrogen. And here we have a negative end at the, the dipole at the fluorine. So you have this very partially negative fluorine that's part of this molecule. And you've got this very partially positive hydrogen that's part of this molecule. That's all intramolecular. It sets up the condition for a intermolecular hydrogen bond. So because of this, if you have these hydrogen bonds, you have very, very strong dipole-dipole attraction, and you can get some interesting properties out of it, like what we see with water. One of the neat things with water, if you've ever seen insects, 
walking on water. Um, they're able to do this because of the strong dipole dipole force that is in water, which is so strong it gets its own name, hydrogen bonding. And this keeps the water molecules really attracted to each other, especially at the surface where they, they're not surrounded by other water molecules because there's nothing above them. So they're really attracted to the ones beside them and below them. So the surface tension ends up being quite strong on water. Um, and they, they, things like insects take advantage of that. Um, they're able to step on top of it. Or if you've ever seen a droplet of water sitting on a surface that is uh, doesn't like water, is, is hydrophobic, um, it will sort of beat up on that surface, like a, on a waxed car, it'll have little beads of water, so they run off and don't dry on the car. Um, and that, again, is because the, the water molecules within that bead of water are super attracted to the ones beside them. Let's not draw water linearly. So you have this water molecule and you have this water molecule. And again, it is the force between them that is the hydrogen bonding. So we see that high surface tension. High solubility well is, an, is another thing. Um, we have ionic and polar substances really dissolve well in water. We call it the universal solvent because it dissolves other substances so well. Not everything, but a lot of things quite well, as long as they have a charge, so ionic, things that you're trying to dissolve, ionic solutes, have charges like sodium chloride. And so water, which also has charges, is able to get in there and, and be attracted to those ions, the ions attract to it. And so they're able to break up the ionic crystal and it dissolves quite well. Not all ion substances, but a lot do. And then polar substances as well will dissolve in water because the polar substances themselves have polarity, the water has polarity, so they're attracted to each other and they dissolve. High heat capacity as well. Um, again, if, if you have a water molecule that is really attracted to another water molecule, because so there's one, there's another there, and we have a hydrogen bond between them as well as all the other water molecules around. I am just drawing one here. Um, because of the partial positive and the, oh, that's supposed to be a negative, dipole here. And again, we have this dipole on this one with a partial negative, quite large partial negative, quite large partial positive with hydrogen. So you get this hydrogen bonding between them and it's surrounded, it's happening all around it. And so if you want to start moving them, you're going to try to mess with this hydrogen bond here, right? You're just pulling it on one side and moving on the other side. So if you are trying to get them moving faster, get them vibrating faster, which is what heating up is, it's going to take a lot of energy to do that. And once you're doing it, it's going to hold on to that energy quite well. So they call this heat capacity. These molecules of water are really attracted to each other so it takes a while a lot of energy to get them moving and once they're moving they, they keep moving they hold that heat quite well as well we see some of these properties um, coming together when we start creating these mixtures so we've heard that oil and water don't mix and remember it can't be because water is not attracted to oil right because all particles are attracted to uh, all molecules attract other molecules right um, it is that the water itself is so attracted to other water molecules they've got the hydrogen bonding here that's happening between the molecules as well so they're really really attracted to each other that they don't get particularly attracted or essentially they sort of exclude the oil they all group up together because they're super attracted to each other and then the oil molecules just sort of end up being left out if they're less dense they end up on top if they're more dense they end up in the water but they definitely end up being separated from the water because water is so attracted to itself or other molecules like it it excludes oil from that group and it ends up being on its own this is why we say oil and water do not mix. It is not that they're not attracted to each other. It's just water is more attracted to other water molecules, excluding the oil.